Thank you, Dr. Carlin. Um, and thank you guys all for coming on this Monday night uh, to watch my uh, master's thesis. I'm going to be, be presenting, as you said, on salt marsh re uh, response and recovery to co-seismic subsidence. This project was funded in part by the Southern California Earthquake Center as well as COAST. A brief overview about what I'm going to be talking about tonight are a background on coastal wetlands and salt marsh characteristics as well as co-seismic subsidence. I'll be going over my methods, stratigraphy, biogeochemistry, and geochronology, as well as the results from these methods. And then I'll discuss FACES interpretations that we made, as well as the paleoenvironmental reconstruction and event identification. And I'll also investigate the wetland response and recovery to these events, as well as um, suggest a few conclusions. So coastal salt marshes are located globally from the tropics to the Arctic. Um, typically, mangroves dominate lower latitudes and coastal salt marshes dominate mid to high latitudes. These are important because they improve the overall water quality, they prevent coastline erosion and protect from marine flooding, as well as supply terrestrial nutrients to the ocean and provide habitats for diverse organisms and act as a critical carbon sink. Despite their importance, nationally, more than 50% of wetland loss has been due to development, and this is majorly from urbanization and agriculture. Even more so, only 10 to 20% of the Pacific coast is suitable for wetland development. As you see in this uh, figure to the right, only, we only see small pockets here and there of really dense uh, wetland of 16 to 25% in few spaces, whereas most of the coast is yellow to white, which is less than 4%. <clears throat> also, less than 10% of California salt marshes are located in Southern California, as you see by this bar graph. Um, this is less than the desert wetlands and the mountain wetlands. And we also only see a small percentage of the historic marshes remaining today. So salt marshes are um, divided into different sub-environments and these are influenced by elevation. So we have subtitle, which is the lowest elevation which is always inundated by seawater. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the high marsh, which is the highest elevation and only inundated during extreme events and storms. The low marsh is um, inundated during the highest high tide and the mud flat um, area is exposed during low tide and inundated during high tides. The sediment is uh, composed of both organic and inorganic material. As we go from low elevation to high elevation, so from subtitle to mudflat to marsh, we see a finding upward sequence. So this percent sand decreases as the percent mud increases. And we also see a rise in organics as we increase in elevation. And all of these are influenced by the sea level change. So if sediment supply is greater than sea level rise, we should see the marsh develop normally. This figure is modified from Allen 2000, where the background colors represent those different sub-environments. So we have, and the yellow is a subtitle, and brown is mudflat, and the green is marsh. And so, and this bar represents sea level. So as the marsh progresses, it will have the resulting stratigraphy here, from subtitle to mudflat to marsh. However, as this animation shows, if sediment supply is less than sea level rise, the marsh will be covered by mudflat sediments and submerged, and then the shoreline will retreat. Relative sea level rise um, is sea level changes that are local to that coast, um, whereas eustatic sea level changes is more global. So relative sea level rise, the factors that interplay in this is uh, sediment supply and local geology, as well as the eustatic sea level change. There's some causes of relative sea level rise. There's shallow subsidence, which we see in the Gulf Coast and the Mississippi River Delta, and this is due to the sediment compaction creating this subsidence. And we also have co-seismic subsidence, which we see in the Pacific Northwest due to the Cascadia subduction zone here, um, which is due to deep-seated tectonic movement. Co-seismic subsidence is a decrease in land elevation due to a seismic event. So we are dropping an elevation at the same time that a seismic event is occurring. Um, this figure is also modified from Allen 2000, similar to the figure I showed you before. However, this one is now um, punctuated by the, these seismic events, um, which this is modeled after the events that we see in the Pacific Northwest. So instead of having a nice subtitle mudflat to marsh, 
the sediments are now dropping in elevation, which changes the stratigraphy. So if we start at subtitle here, and I have the resulting stratigraphy on the right-hand side, the, norm, the marsh will, normally, uh, will accrete normally between events. So the subtitle will move up to mudflat. However, in the, event of a, in the event of an event, um, it will decrease in elevation back down to subtitle. And so from here, we would again have normal marsh accretion to mudflat and to marsh. When another event occurs, it will change the elevation and drop it down to the subtitle environment, and so on and so forth as more events occur. Where have we seen co-seismic subsidence before? Um, in the Cascadia subduction zone region, Nelson et al. did a study in 1996. Um, using lithostratigraphy, micropaleontology, and radiocarbon dating, they found 10 peat to mud contacts in the Coos Bay area in Oregon. And they set up five criteria to assess um, co-seismic subsidence. And from these criteria, they found that three out of 10 of these peat to mud contacts were caused by co-seismic subsidence. Um, the five criteria for co-seismic subsidence were that it was spatially extensive. So it happens in multiple locations in that one area. Um, it's a, an abrupt contact, so there's a sharp sedimentary change in the sediment. Long-lasting, so there's a prolonged change in the depositional environment. And they're coincident with tsunami deposits, as well as peat to mud contact. So peat is a very high organic rich uh, sediment, and mud is a very low organic rich sediment. Um, so deformation and strike slip faults would, should be a little bit different than uh, subsidence in the Cascadia subduction zones. However, we do see so co-seismic subsidence in strike slip settings. Newton et al. did a study in San Francisco Bay and modified the criteria previously set by Nelson to better suit strike slip fault earthquakes. Um, one of the things that they had changed was that tsunami deposits may in fact indicate co-seismic subsidence in the larger Cascadia subduction zone settings. However, for strike slip fault, they felt that diatom evidence for relative sea level rise and rapid aggradation of coarse materials better suit, are better suited for the strike slip fault setting. From their study, they found three instances of possible co-seismic subsidence. Kohler et al. 2005 also looked at co-seismic subsidence in the strike slip setting. Um, they inferred that seven buried peat layers were resulting from co-seismic subsidence along the San Gregorio Fault. And they used um, the criteria set up by Knudsen and Nelson and found that two of their contacts were um, caused by co-seismic subsidence, which are in the green. Two of them in the yellow were possibly caused by co-seismic subsidence. And five in the red were not caused by co-seismic subsidence. Very few studies have focused on wetlands in Southern California. Leeper et al. did a study in Seal Beach wetlands um, using a multi-proxy approach on multiple cores throughout the wetland, as you see right here. Um, they identified sharp contacts of organic rich layers buried by the mud sediments and interpreted that three events resulted from co-seismic subsidence along the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone. <coughs> This study intends to build upon the work of Leeper et al. using the Seal Beach wetlands to investigate wetland response to co-seismic subsidence. And for my thesis, we will reconstruct the paleoenvironmental changes in the Seal Beach wetlands, as well as identify possible co-seismic subsidence events and characterize the environmental impact that, impact that events had on wetland development. My study location is the Seal Beach wetlands in Southern California, denoted by the red dot, in respect to the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Fault is probably the most widely known fault in California. However, the Seal Beach wetlands is most affected by the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone, which we see right here. This is the San Andreas Fault. So it's about 80 kilometers southwest of the San Andreas Fault. Seal Beach wetlands is this red dot. Um, it consists of multiple northwest trending um, right lateral strike slip faults and displays wrench tectonic style deformation. Um, according to the Southern California Earthquake Center, probable mag magnitudes for this fault are between 6 to 7.4. And the last major earthquake was in 1933, which is a magnitude of 6.4, which is right where the yellow dot is. The Seal Beach wetlands are a low-lying, uh, low-energy coastal salt marsh, which straddle the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone, right here. Um, this red line denotes where um, the, it's the inferred fault geometry of the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone overlaying on top of the Seal Beach wetlands. 
The COB wetlands has a mean tidal range of 1.2 and is also a migratory resting point for endangered species such as the green sea turtle and the belding savanna sparrow. There are 19 different species present with 12 dominant species in the seal beach wetlands. A few of the high marsh flora are glasswort, pickleweed, alkali heath, and estuary sea blight. And the low marsh flora consists of cordgrass, pickleweed, and saltwort, where we looked at the stable carbon values for pickleweed later in the study. For my methods, four vibracores were collected from the seal beach wetlands in February of 2013 using a portable vibracore. Um, they were extracted by hand and cut in two sections in the field and then transported to CSUF cold, cold storage, where in April 2015, SB019VC, which is the focus of this study in the red star, um, was split and visually described. For stratigraphic analyses, we did loss on ignition and magnetic susceptibility at one centimeter intervals for the full core. Um, the loss on ignition was to determine percent total organic matter as well as percent um, total carbonate and magnetic susceptibility was to determine the amount of heavy magnetic material. Grain size was also performed on the core at one centimeter intervals, but this was at specific locations throughout the core um, to ground truth to the visual descriptions and gain higher resolution across observed contacts, which totaled 191 samples. We sent our archive sections to scripts to be scanned at three different energies um, to determine for x-ray fluorescence to determine the relative elemental abundances. Uh, we focused on bromine, iron, strontium, zirconium, and rubidium. For biogeochemical analyses, we sent 12 samples to the Global Aquatic Research Team for stable carbon uh, C to N ratios and lignin phenols. These data were incorporated into a 3N member mixing model. And we also ran 10 sam samples of stable carbon in the Lloyd Stable Carbon Isotope Lab to gain a higher resolution across the contact. For geochronological analyses, uh, we performed lead 210 and cesium 137 dating on the first 50 centimeters of the core in two centimeter intervals. The lead 210 was used to determine sediment accumulation rates for the past 150 years, and the cesium 137 was used to establish 1953-1963 time horizons. We also sent 24 carbon-14 samples to the Keck Cycle AMS facility in UCI for radiocarbon dating. For my results, on the left we see the per percent total organic matter against the core depth, and on the right we have total carbonate against core depth, and on the right, yes. Um, so for both of these we can see that they both generally increase up core. However, for the percent total organic matter, we see that it's punctuated by, by abrupt decreases. And we see this a few times at about 213, 174, and 121. And then the total carbonate has sig four significant low points, um, the lowest um, being at the base of the core. For the magnetic susceptibility, our values were between 0 and 12. We see three prominent peaks with sharp basal contacts, as well as two smaller peaks at the base of the core. For grain size, on the left-hand side, we have the cumulative percent. Uh, the yellow is percent sand, the gray is percent silt, and the black is percent clay. We see at the base of the core, we have our coarser material, so our sandy silt, silty sand, and as we go up, it gets uh, finer, so there's a fining upward sequence. However, there are a few coarse layers interbedded in between. For our median sand size, we have uniform sand size in two sections, so at the lower section and at the top of the core. This is a very fine sand that is well sorted and very small, so less than 200 microns. And we also have variable areas where the sand is poorly sorted and ranges from 200 to 600 micron, microns. For cesium-137, this gave us back two dates. The first occurrence was between 12 to 14 centimeters, so that gave us our 1953 date. And our peak of cesium-137 was between 10 to 12 centimeters, giving us our second date of 1963. From these data, we found as an accumulation rate of 2.2 millimeters per year. Our lead 210 data was not as conclusive as our cesium-137. Um, the raw scores are in white here. They gave us a very poor relationship of 0 0.07, as well as an accumulation rate of 5.2 millimeters per year. When we corrected it for percent TOM, which is shown in the purple, 
the relationship was a little bit better at 0.16, um, but still that is very poor, and that gave us an accumulation rate of 3.5. So we can say that the accumulation rate for, based on the lead 210 data is between three to five millimeters per year. And that when incorporated with the cesium-137, our range is from two to five millimeters per year. However, we think that it's closer to two because the cesium data was more reliable. This chart's a little bit hard to read, but the important things to pull out are that the, range, the age ranged from 147 to 4,117 calibrated years before present. We dated shells, charcoal, and plant material. And then we took 11 of these dates, which are shown in white, and incorporated them into an age model. And 13 of these dates were not used due to them having a large error or possible mixing. And the age model gave us an overall average accumulation rate of 0.8 plus or minus 0.04 millimeters per year. For biogeochemical analyses, we sent the 12 samples to the Global Aquatic Research Team, along with our percent total organic matter that we derived from our loss on ignition analysis. They returned percent organic content, as well as lignin abundance, stable carbon, and C to N ratios. And these were put into a 3N member mixing model of C3 plants, C4 plants, which we combined to create percent marsh, and also subtitle. When plotting these, we found two historic marsh layers in the core. We also did a stable carbon analyses on 10 centimeters to across one sedimentary contact where we see at the bottom of the core it's 125 centimeters we have more depleted values and then once we cross the contact there's an abrupt shift to more enriched values and as we head up the core they start becoming more and more depleted we have our bromine counts uh, plotted against our core depth, and here we see the same trends as we did with percent TOM, uh, where it's increasing up core. However, it does have a few areas of um, punctuated decreases. So when we plot it against percent TOM, we have a very positive relationship of 0.86, which means we can use um, them as a proxy for one another. For our iron counts against core depth, we see that the highest uh, counts are towards the center of the core. And when we plot it against percent TOM, we see that the iron counts are maximized between 5 to 15%. Um, we think that, the, that lower percent TOM is responding to a lack of detrital clays, and that at higher TOM, more than 15%, that reflects lack of redox conditions. So, um, at between 5 and 15% TOM, the clay and redox are maximized, which makes our counts higher. Strontium counts plotted against core depth. We see the, most, the highest amount at the bottom of the core, and then it decreases upward. So this is the opposite of what we saw with percent total organic matter. And in fact, when plotted against it with the log of the SR counts, we see an inverse relationship a very strong inverse relationship at 0.71. When we plotted zirconium to rubidium, uh, we have the highest count or the highest range at the bottom, and we also have two distinct peaks right here at 14 centimeters and 119 centimeters. So we use these data to characterize the sub-environments, and so we were able to um, differentiate between marsh, subtital, marsh, mudflat, and subtital. Um, so the marsh was relatively fine sediment and high TOM, so greater than 15%. We saw elevated bromine abundances, as well as consistent mixing model results of greater than 50% from those biogeochemical proxies. We also found the most depleted stable carbon values. For mudflat, we see very fine sediment and a variability in median sand size between um, 200 and 600 microns, a moderate uh, percent total organic matter from 5 to 15 percent, and an elevated iron count, as well as stable carbon values ranging from negative 23 to negative 21 per mil. 
For subtitle, we see low organic matter um, and low carbonate values, so these are less than 5%. Also, relatively coarse sediment, so that's going to be our sandy silt, silty sand layers. We saw elevated strontium abundances as well as stable carbon values between negative 21 and negative 15 per mil. FACI sequences um, were interpreted for the entire core, and those allowed us to reconstruct the paleoenvironmental changes in the wetlands. So here we're going to step through a series of changing environments over time. We have our faces on the left, so subtitle is yellow, sorry, on the right. Subtitle is yellow, mudflat is brown, and marsh is green. <coughs> and here we have the subtitle represented by blue, mudflat represented by the gray, and marsh represented by the green. The star is the location of SB019VC. So 4600 Cal years BP, the wetland is submerged in a subtidal environment, and then it slowly accretes into the marsh, in, sorry, into the mudflat environment, and then the initial marsh colonization occurs around 2500 Cal years BP. And this is our first full facey sequence, um, a normal marsh succession from subtidal to mudflat to marsh. At about 2400 Cal years BP, the marsh is then submerged back into a subtidal environment. And then it accretes into a mudflat environment, followed by a marsh at 1700 Cal years BP. After this, the marsh submerges into a mudflat environment, and then submerges again into a subtidal environment where we then see at 1300 Cal years BP normal marsh accretion <clears throat> from mudflat and then back to marsh at 875 Cal years BP. Um, twice we see, um, in the past 800 years, we see the same facey succession. It goes from marsh and then it hits mudflats and then back to marsh and then it'll hit mudflat again and back to marsh. So um, we believe that these submergent events um, correspond to co-seismic subsidence. So we were able to, um, these lines, the red lines going horizontally, those are our um, proposed subsidence events. So these all occur in the upper 250 centimeters of our core. Our oldest event is event A at 213 centimeters, and our youngest event is event E at 25 centimeters. The full core with all the data is going to be here at the bottom, and we're going to be looking at the specific events up here at the top. With this red line, again, is the proposed event contact. So event A occurred at 2392 Cal years BP, and this was characterized by a marsh facies overlain by subtidal sediment. Here we see a peak in magnetic susceptibility, an abrupt decrease in percent TOM, and a sharp increase in sands. Event B occurred at 1832 Cal years BP and was characterized by marsh sediment overlain by mudflat sediments. We don't see a peak in magnetic susceptibility, however, we do see a decrease in percent TOM. Event C occurred at 1305 Cal years BP, um, which was a mudflat layer overlain by subtidal sediments. Here we do see a peak in magnetic susceptibility and a decrease in both percent TOM and percent TCO3. We also see a, an increase in percent sand and a shift from variable median sand size to uniform median sand size. This was also the event that we did the stable carbon analyses on across the contact. So in the background color of this, that corresponds with the facies. So we have mud flat and brown and subtitle in yellow. And we also have uh, stable carbon isotope values for subtitle environments in the overlaying one um, gray bars and then we have stable carbon values for the marsh plants on this side. So we see at the bottom at 125 centimeters that they have very depleted values um, as they go up towards the contact and as they cross the contact there's a shift into more enriched values. <coughs> and then they slowly become more depleted as they head back into that mud flat state. 
For event D, it occurred at 818 Cal years BP. We see marsh deposits buried by mudflat sediments. There's no peak in magnetic susceptibility. However, there's both a decrease in percent total organic matter as well as percent carbonate. We see a spike in percent sand. And this event uh, is one of the events that corresponds with the, buried, uh, the historical buried marsh layers. Our last event, event E, is at 176 Cal years BP, um, which was characterized by a marsh facies overlain by mudflat sediments. We see a decrease in percent TOM and a decrease in percent uh, TCO3, as well as a small peak in magnetic susceptibility with a sharp basal contact. So now that we've defined the events, were they caused by co-seismic subsidence? So we put, um, we looked at the criteria set um, by Nelson and Knudsen, which were that they were spatially extensive, that they happen in multiple locations throughout the marsh. They showed abrupt contacts, which is a sudden shift in sedimentary uh, contacts. They were long lasting, so the environmental change was prolonged. There's a potential tsunami deposit, and they were characterized by peat to mud contacts. So for event A, um, event A satisfied four of the criteria. Um, one, it was spatially extensive because this is one of the events that lines up with a previous study from Leeper et al. The ages may be a little bit off, and I believe, we believe that that's because of the way that we dated our core. So SB019, this study dated the full core and then put those ages into an age model, and our event ages were interpolated from that, whereas Leeper et al. dated their specific contacts. Oh, sorry. Um, event A also had abrupt contacts, it was long-lasting, and there, it was uh, characterized by a peat to mud contact. So that was a total of four criteria. Event B was characterized by abrupt contacts, long-lasting, and peat to mud contacts. So that satisfied three of the criteria. Event C was also spatially extensive as it lined up with one of uh, Leeper et al's events. It was characterized by sharp contacts and was long-lasting. Um, we say three to four because it could possibly be a potential tsunami deposit um, in that there was a spike in magnetic susceptibility for this event and there's also a spike in zirconium to rubidium. Event D satisfied three criteria. It had abrupt contacts, it was long-lasting, and it was characterized by a peat to mud contact. And lastly, event E, this is the one that we are most confident in as, the, as it satisfies the most criteria from four to five. Um, it's spatially extensive. It's the last event that lined up with uh, the event by Leeper et al. It had abrupt contacts, it was long lasting, and was characterized by a peat to mud contact. This one also had a spike in magnetic susceptibility and corresponds with a spike in zirconium to rubidium. So we think that it could potentially be a tsunami or related to a tsunami deposit. So a question that has come up um, is that we see five potential events in SB019. However, Leeper et al. found three events um, which correspond to the stars here. He on they only found three events in their core, SB002. So why is there a difference? We think that it's possibly because of the core location. So SB019VC is located on the fringes of the marsh, whereas SB002 is located towards the center of the marsh. And we think that the center of the marsh is experiencing more subsidence, uh, more so than at the fringes of the marsh. So to further explain this, I'm going to look at the first three events in, that we found in my core, A, B, and C. When event A happens, we're both in the subtitle sediment. However, SB002 subsides a little bit more than SB019. They both accrete, however, SB019 reaches that marsh stage, where SB002 does not. Before the next event, event B happens, which drops this further down into a lower mud flat. And now this one is a marsh and has now been dropped down to a mud flat. And as they both accrete, they don't make it back up to the marsh before the next event occurs, event C, which drops them both down into the subtitle. So as you can see, this is what we are seeing over here in SB019VC. 
whereas SB002 would only see an event contact at the top and bottom, and we would preserve one right in the middle because of that environmental change. It's important to quantify subsidence. However, um, this study lacked an elevation marker in our data set, um, such as micropaleontology. So we used modern elevation data and interpreted the sub-environment elevations. So at sea level, which is a right, right about here, it's the interface of subtidal and mudflat, that's zero. And then mudflat goes all the way up to about 1.1 meters. And then from there, marsh takes over to about 0.25 meters. So we think that in order to go from marsh down to subtidal, subsidence must be greater than 1.1 meters. And in order for marsh to go to mudflat, it would be less than 1.1 meters. So if our event A was inferred to have the most subsidence because the facies go from marsh, from marsh down to subtidal. So we think that this is greater than 1.1 meters. Event C is our only other event that goes down to the subtitle level. Um, and no exact estimates can be made here because there's no lower limit uh, for the subtitle section. However, we infer that it's likely less subsided, it's subsided less than um, event A going from marsh to subtitle because there is a very thin deposit here. Events B, D, and E go from marsh to mudflat, so we infer that their subsidence is less than 1.1 meters. Now that we've quantified subsidence, we want to look at how the marsh recovers from this. Um, so this is our age model, and our over aver overall average accumulation rate is 0.88 plus or minus 0.04 millimeters per year, which is denoted by this brown line going across. And our regional sea level rise rate is 0.8 plus or minus 0.3 millimeters per year, which is the blue line going across. So we see that the overall average sedimentation rate is greater than the regional sea level rise rate, which is why we continue to see the marsh persist. However, in order to get a better idea of what's happening in between events, we need to be able to look at sedimentation rates um, using two radiocarbon ages that occur between events. And we were able to do this with two of them. As you can see, these are both higher than the overall average um, sedimentation rate. So what we're seeing is that there, there, this is an event right here, there's a lag time and then it rapidly increases um, and then slows down as it starts um, finishing full recovery. So this graph shows sedimentation rate going up and then this is towards recovery. So our event is in the red line here and we see there's a lag time before sedimentation rate is increased and then it slows down as the marsh reaches full recovery. <clears throat> so the marsh has been recovering after each event, but as we move up core, we see less and less subsidence. Is the marsh possibly becoming more resilient to co-seismic subsidence? Um, a good example of this is the 1933 earthquake, um, which the epicenter for it is right here and Seal Beach Wetlands is right here. It's about 13 kilometers away, which it was a magnitude uh, 6.4. And the Long Beach earthquake aftershock, which is less than a kilometer away, and magnitude 4.9. This is our section of the core where we should see these events. At the base, between 28 to 29, we have our radiocarbon age of 1670 AD. And our event E age, which is our youngest event, at 1789 AD. We also have our cesium-137 age of 1953. And according to our age model, the 1933 earthquake should land about here. However, in our facies, instead of seeing submergence, we're seeing the marsh accrete from mudflat into a marsh. So to explain the overall resiliency, uh, we'll step through a conceptual model and look at the stratigraphy um, over time. So this is the Seal Beach wetlands, and we have a cross section on the bottom, which goes from A to A prime. The SB019 is denoted by the black star in both pictures. Subtitle is yellow, mudflat is gray, and marsh is green. So prior to the event, we have an established wetland that is dominated by the marsh. And then post-event, the marsh is now submerged underwater, and we can see subtitle sediments buried on top of the marsh. 
the marsh actively recovers into mudflats and then into full recovery back to marsh state. After the next event, uh, the marsh subsides, but it doesn't go back to subtidal. It goes to the mudflat stage, which means that it will take less time to recover back into the full marsh state. So if there were another event to occur, like the 1933 earthquake, um, it may not result in any subsidence and the area would remain unchanged. Um, two, we suggest two reasons for this um, resiliency. Seismic strengthening is one of them and the other is that the past earthquakes were stronger than the 1933 earthquake. So to explain stri seismic strengthening a little bit, it's forced consolidation over a period of time. So as more and more earthquakes happen, the sediment becomes more and more consolidated over time. So, sorry, we have unconsolidated sediments covered, covering consolidated sediment. So during an earthquake, we still have the co-seismic subsidence here, but now this portion of the unconsolidated sediment becomes consolidated by force. So the force consolidation plus the co-seismic subsidence equal the total subsidence. If we take this column and add a new deposit and another earthquake, we're gonna still see the co-seismic subsidence at the bottom. However, now there is less force consolidation of this unconsolidated material. So the force consolidation plus co-seismic subsidence is the total subsidence, but it's less than the previous earthquake. And if we do this one more time, we'll still see the co-seismic subsidence, but that will equal the total subsidence. And so we see less and less subsidence as more and more earthquakes occur. Our second possible reason is that there were larger historic earthquakes. Um, so the 1933 event would occur about right here, and that was a 6.4. So possibly um, the earthquakes, the earthquakes, that created these environmental changes were bigger than that. The recurrence interval for the last five events were roughly 500 years, whereas from our last event um, to present would be around 150 years. So possibly there hasn't been enough time for one of these bigger earthquakes to rupture on the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone. For my conclusions, we identified five co-seismic subsidence events, three which correspond to events identified in cores previously. Trends indicate that over time, the marsh is becoming more resilient to co-seismic subsidence. And two possible explanations for the subsidence are um, seismic strengthening over time or that, lar that earthquakes were larger in the past. I'd like to acknowledge my thesis advisor, Dr. Carlin, for agreeing to take me on as a master's student and being extremely supportive through the process. And my committee, Dr. Lloyd, as well as Dr. Rhodes, why are you laughing? Dr. Rhodes and Dr. Kirby. And the master's students, Robert Leeper, all of these guys. And of course, Mr. Henderson for my first 101 class a very long time ago. And lastly, my wonderful family for being extremely supportive during this crazy master's process.